The title of the sermon is Arminianism and Calvinism. We're in John chapter 6 this morning, and we're going to be studying verses 36 through 59. We're going to be hanging out in the deep weeds this morning. We're going to move from the shallow end of the pool to the deep end of the pool this morning. You know, a lot of pastors don't talk about these things to their church. They, they uh, just let their church uh, members live in the dark, if you will, or discover these things on their own. But I, I think you're smarter than that. I, I think you're just as intelligent, most of you, or a lot of you more so than me. And you want to know about these, these deeper questions, these deeper issues. And so we're going to talk about these things this morning because I think they matter. And you will encounter them as you read through Scripture. And so Arminianism and Calvinism are two different um, viewpoints on the subject of salvation. And the theological word for that is soteriology, the study of salvation. Soteriology. And so uh, Arminian, Arminianism, I'm an Arminian, Arminian, Arminianism is named after Jacob Arminianus. He was uh, lived from 1560 to 1609. He was a Dutch theologian. Calvinism is named after John Calvin. He was a contemporary of Jacob Arminianus. Uh, he lived from 1509 to 1564. Sorry, I said that wrong. It's Arminius. Too many innies in that word. John Calvin was a French theologian. So these guys lived at the same time. Uh, they lived during the, the, the years of the Protestant Reformation. And they were both Protestants, but they disagreed on this subject of salvation and soteriology. Now, both systems of theology can be summed up with five points. And so if you're interested, and you can take down these notes, and you can look up more information about these online, but I'm just going to mention these. Uh, these two systems. First of all, Arminianism is uh, known by the facts of Arminianism. You can see those on the screen above, the facts of Arminianism. It's, a, it's an acronym. The F stands for freed to believe by God's grace. And so what Arminians believe is that God enables us to believe in Christ. But then we also have the ability to reject him. So we are freed to believe. The A is atonement for all, which just means that Christ died for everyone. He died for the sins of the whole world. The C stands for conditional election. Conditional election. Which means that God chooses to save those who believe in Jesus Christ. God chooses to save some based on a condition. What's that condition? The condition of faith, that they put their faith in Jesus. So God chooses to save those who believe in Jesus Christ. The T stands for total depravity. On this point, Calvinists and Arminians agree that lost people cannot turn to Christ without God's what's called pervenient grace. You'll hear that word a lot this morning. Lost people cannot turn from their sins, turn to Christ without God's pervenient grace. That word means grace that enables, enabling grace, grace that goes before salvation. And uh, so, and then the S stands for security in Christ. Security in Christ. So when God saves you, he will hold you securely and not allow you to fall away. Let's look at the TULIP of Calvinism. Calvin, Calvinism is remembered by the acronym TULIP, like flower, T-U-L-I-P. The T stands for total depravity. We already mentioned that. Lost people cannot turn to Christ without God's enabling, prevenient grace. The U stands for unconditional election, whereas Arminians believe in conditional election, that God chooses to save those who believe. Calvinists believe that before time, God chose to save some, not on any condition. He just chose to save some and not others, and then those put their faith in Christ for salvation. The rest, God sends to hell. The L stands for limited atonement. Calvinists believe that Christ did not die for the sins of the whole world. He only died for those whom God elected, for the elect. That's a limited atonement. The I stands for irresistible grace. Irresistible grace means that God's prevenient, enabling grace, whenever God 
If you're one of the elect, then at some point of your life, through the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit will begin to move in your heart, open your eyes, he will draw you to Christ, and that drawing, that grace, will be irresistible. If you're one of the elect, you will turn to Christ. And then the P stands for perseverance of the saints, which this is where Arminians and Calvinists can agree that when God saves you, he will hold you securely and not allow you to fall away. Now, whatever position you choose with regard to salvation, whether it's Arminianism or Calvinism, will affect you. It already does. You probably already have a stance on these matters, even if you didn't realize what it was called. But where you stand on, on these issues will affect the way that you look at salvation. It will affect the way that you look at God. It will affect the way that you read Scripture. It will affect the way that you look at lost people. It will affect the way that you look at the mission of the church and evangelism, even preaching and witnessing. And so it really does make an impact on your Christian life, where you, where you um, land on the issue of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. And so today we're going to look at some of the similarities and differences between these two viewpoints. Arminianism and Calvinism. And we're going to do that by looking at this passage, John 6, picking up with verse 36 through 59, because this passage is one of the most important passages with regard to this issue. It has some of the most important verses that are very, very controversial, major points of debate, debate between Calvinism and Arminianism. Now, let me just say that within the Southern Baptist Convention, of which we are a part, we're Southern Baptist Church, um, you have both Calvinists and Arminians, and we try our best to coexist, and we do. We have for ever since the beginning of the denomination. And so I don't believe, I'm an Arminian, but I don't believe that Calvinists are evil uh, or anything like that. Um, it, it's just we have a different viewpoint, and you can be belong to our church, and you don't have to agree with me on all these different points of the differences between Calvinism and Arminianism. But I think it really does make a difference in your Christian life. And, uh, and so yeah, I, th I think you'll see that this morning. So what we're going to do as we go through this passage, John chapter 6, is I'm going to point out five truths of salvation that are taught in this passage. Five truths of salvation. And then I'm going to show you the similarities and differences of Calvinism and Arminianism. How they, they look at these issues, how they interpret these verses differently. Okay? So the first truth about salvation, if you're taking notes, is that salvation is only given to some. Salvation is only given to some, or only some are saved. Not everybody goes to heaven. And you'll see that in this passage, verses 36 through 37 is where we're going to start. Jesus is speaking. This is one of Jesus' major discourses, one of his major talks in the Gospel of John. He says, and he's speaking to the Jews who were critical of him or, or um, rejecting him. And he says to them, but as I told you, you've seen me, yet you do not believe. Now notice this verse, verse 37. This is a very, very controversial verse. Jesus said, everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast down. Now Calvinists believe that this verse 37, that's where I want you to focus for a moment. They believe that verse 37 is proof of unconditional election and irresistible grace. And they would interpret that verse like this. They would say that the Father has chosen a select few to give to the Son, the elect. Those are called the elect. And these, the Father, irresistibly draws to Jesus for salvation. Those who don't believe, such as the Jews, well, the reason why they don't believe is because they're not the elect. The Father hasn't given them to the Son. So that's how a Calvinist would interpret it. In fact, the Calvinist translation of verse 37 might go something like this. The Father has chosen a few to be saved, to see... The Jews that he's talking to, they're rejecting him. And so this is, what, this is Jesus' response to them, according to Calvinists. The Father has chosen a few to be saved. 
and they will be gifted with the faith to believe and irresistibly drawn to Christ for salvation. So Jesus says, does it bother me that you guys are not coming to me? It just means God hasn't, the Father hasn't given you to me. You're not one of the chosen. Those the Father has chosen, they will come to me. And so that's a Calvinist uh, interpretation. The Reformation Study Bible says it like this. The Reformation Study Bible is a, a Calvinist-leaning study Bible. In fact, it's totally Calvinist. And I own a copy, and I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a very orthodox, good study Bible, um, except for when it comes to, to the issue of um, soteriology, Calvinism, and Arminianism, the doctrine of election, specifically. So this is what it says. It says, God leads to faith all whom he plans to redeem. The redemption of the elect is certain, since it is secured by the sovereign purpose and invincible power of God himself to draw them to the Son and secure them in his hand. So in other words, in order to, in, in, according to Calvinists, God first chooses to give some to Christ, and then those believe, the ones he has chosen. Now an Arminian interpretation would be different. God chooses those who believe in Christ for salvation. In other words, this verse says that, in verse 37, everyone the Father gives me will come to me. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. Well, the question is, who does the Father give to Jesus? And what does that mean, giving to Jesus? And what does come to me mean? See, all these things matter. So let's look at the text a little bit more closely. I want to focus on the first part of verse 37. Now, this would be called John 6, 37a. Sometimes you'll see that when you're reading a book or something or a Bible study. John 6, 37a, that means the first part of that verse. Uh, in a moment, we'll look at John 6, 37b. That'll be the second part of the verse. So John 6, 37a, again, it says, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. So, the first part, everyone the Father gives me, it simply means this. All who believe in Christ. All who believe in Christ. Because who are those that the Father has given to Christ? The Father gives to Christ all those who believe in Christ. The Father, in other words, the Father doesn't choose to save everyone. He chooses to save who? Those who believe. Um, in verses, a couple of verses down, in verses 39 through 40, it equates those given to the Son, the Father gives to the Son, with those who believe. Let me read this to you, John 6, 39 through 40. Jesus said, This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, there's the word given me, but should raise them up on the last day. Verse 40 says the same thing, just using different terminology. He says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So in these two verses, he equates those the Father gives to the Son with those who believe in the Son. And so it's true that the Father only gives some to the Son. But who does he give to the Son? Those whom he knows will put their faith in Jesus Christ. Calvinists say that God chooses a few arbitrarily and unconditionally. In other words, God, before time, chooses to save some, not based on anything about that person. That's what that word unconditional means. It's not based on any condition that they meet or he knows they will meet. He just chooses some for salvation, and the rest he chooses for reprobation or damnation. Now the second part of that, that phrase, John 6, 37a, is will come to me. The first part is everyone the Father gives me, which just means all who believe in Christ. The second part is will come to me. Now, that simply means will be saved. Everyone the Father gives me, everyone who believes in me, will be saved. Now why do I say that? Well, one of the mistakes that Calvinists make with this passage, and this is where knowing the Greek text or studying the Greek text is very, very helpful. Sometimes people will wonder, 
Why do you need to know the Hebrew and the Greek? Isn't the English text enough? Why do you have to study the commentaries that show you the Hebrew and the Greek? Does it really matter? I'll show you why it matters right here. Notice that in verse 37, the word come is used twice. Where Jesus says, everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And then in the second part of verse 37, and the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. One of the mistakes that Calvinists make is they say that those two words for come mean the same thing. The problem is, if you look at the Greek, it's two totally different words. They're both translated come in English, but in Greek, they're two different words, and they mean two different things. I'll show you. So, um, the ver if you're, a couple of verses prior to this passage is in verse 35. John 6, 35, and in this, this verse, we can clearly see this word come means believe. John 6, 35 says this, it should be up on the screen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Now here, everyone agrees that the word come is equated parallel to the word believe. Everyone who comes to me, everyone who believes in me. Well, that word come in verse 35, it's a different word than the word come in John 6.37a. The word come in John 6.35, I have the Greek terms up, up there for Brandy. She wanted to know how to spell these Greek terms, okay? So the word come in John 6.35 is erkomai. Erkomai, and it emphasizes the process of coming. So that would be faith, believing in Jesus. So in John 6.35, it's talking about faith. I'm the bread of life, whoever comes to me, whoever believes in me. But in John 6.37a, it's a different word. The Greek word is heko, and it, it emphasizes the idea of reaching a destination. Not the process but the idea of reaching a destination, of, of actually getting somewhere. And so, erkomai emphasizes believing, but heko emphasizes entering the kingdom of heaven, or final salvation, or being welcomed into heaven, or receiving your final salvation, which is a glorified body. You can see this word, word heko used this way in another verse, Matthew 8.11. Jesus said this, Matthew 8, 11. I heard you, Gloria. I think we all heard you that time. Listen to this. Jesus said, I tell you that many will come, that's the word echo, many will come from east and west to share the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. You see, this verse is not talking about Believing, He's not saying, I tell you that many will believe from east and west to share. He's talking about many come, many will come, many will arrive at heaven, at the kingdom of heaven, at salvation. Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so the Calvinist interpretation of John 6, 37a is this. Everyone the Father chooses will believe. The Armenian interpretation is all who believe in Jesus Christ will be saved. All who believe in Jesus Christ will be saved. Because, this is John 6, 37a, because when Jesus says, everyone the Father gives me, that means all who believe. Who does the Father give to Jesus? All who believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. What does it mean to come to him? Well, that word come, hecho, is not talking about believe, it's talking about salvation. Everyone the Father gives me, everyone who will believe, will be saved. That's the first part of that verse. And so this is Jesus' response to the unbelief of the Jews. His response is, whenever they didn't believe in him, was, listen, I understand that everybody's not going to accept me. I understand that everybody's not going to be saved. He knew that God had chosen to save only some, those who would put their faith in Jesus Christ. We see this in Matthew 7, 14. Jesus said, how narrow is the gate, and 
difficult the road that leads to life, and a few find it. In other words, not everybody goes to heaven. Not everybody gets saved because not everybody believes in Jesus. Okay? So that's the first point. Number two, let's move on to a second truth about salvation. The second one is this. Salvation will not be withheld to those who believe in Christ or to the one who believes in Christ. Salvation will not be withheld to the one who believes in Christ. Now we're going to look at the second part of John 6.37. John 6.37b. Jesus said, And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. Now remember, in the first part of the verse, the word come means salvation, means arriving. But this, in John 6.37b, it's the Greek word erkomai, and it means believe. So, when Jesus says, and the one who comes to me, he means the one who believes in me. And then the next part, I will never cast out, means I will not reject them for salvation. I will, deny, I will not deny salvation to anyone who believes in me. Anyone who comes in faith to Jesus Christ will not be rejected. They will not be denied. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you've done, how bad you've been. If you come to Jesus Christ with faith for salvation, he will not reject you. He will not deny you. And that's what this verse is saying. This verse doesn't mean, by the way, that they will be thrown out of heaven. When it says, and the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. He's not saying that, that they won't be thrown out of heaven. He's talking about they will not be denied entrance into heaven in the first place. Uh, Luke, verse 13, verses 27 through 28, use this word cast out in the same way. The Greek word is uh, ekbalo exo. And Jesus says, but he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Now, it's not saying that they'll be thrown out of heaven, but it's talking about they will not be, they will not be given entrance to heaven. When it's time for the judgment day, those who don't have faith in Jesus they will not be allowed entrance into heaven. So this part of John 6, 37, the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. It's talking about uh, not denying them entrance into salvation, not denying them salvation. Now, Calvinists would agree with this interpretation to a point. They would say that the problem is only some can believe because Christ didn't die for everyone, only the elect. And therefore, God only makes salvation available to the elect. So Arminians would say anyone who believes in Christ will not be denied. Anyone who wants salvation and puts their faith in Jesus Christ will not be rejected. Calvinists would say, well, the problem with that is that that word anyone is kind of tricky because God hasn't chosen everyone for salvation. Only the elect who come to Christ for salvation, who will come to Christ for salvation, only those will not be denied salvation. But Arminians would say that, that God wants to save everybody, that anybody who comes to Jesus in faith can be saved, that you can go with confidence and say with confidence to any stranger you ever meet, you don't have to wonder, well, if you're the elect, you can believe in Jesus and be saved. You can just say to anybody you encounter, if you'll put your faith in Jesus Christ, he will save you. Now, there's reasons why we believe that. A couple reasons. Number one, we know from Scripture that God wants to save everybody. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4 says this. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. A second reason why we believe that anyone can come to Christ to be saved is that Christ died to save everyone. Christ died for the salvation of everyone. It says in, in that same passage, 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 through 6, For there is one God, 
and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. So it doesn't make sense to say that God wants to save everybody, and that God sent Jesus to die for the sins of everybody, but that God only gives some the opportunity to be saved. Doesn't make sense. All right, let's move on to a third truth about salvation. The third truth is that salvation cannot be lost. Salvation cannot be lost. Now, this is a point at which Baptists and Calvinists agree. Now, as I said, some Baptists are Calvinists, some Baptists are Arminians. But all Baptists agree that you cannot lose your salvation. They believe in what's called the doctrine of eternal security. It's also called the perseverance of the saints, that once you get saved, you cannot lose your salvation. Now, in contrast to that, Wesleyans, those who come from the Wesleyan tradition, those are uh, followers of John Wesley, who founded the Methodist, United Methodist religion, or not just the United Methodist Church, but all the Methodist churches, and, and all those, in fact, all of the Pentecostals, Charismatics, they actually come from the Wesleyan tradition. That's why it's very rare that you'll find a Calvinist Pentecostal. Uh, they're almost all Arminian. Um, but Wesleyans say that to inherit eternal life, you must keep believing. Now, we agree with that. But we would say, uh, those who believe in eternal security would say, you must keep believing, but once you get saved, God so changes your heart. Remember, you're born again. You're regenerated when you get saved. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And so when that happens, Jesus is the one holding you securely. Once you get saved, you will not fall away because you've been so changed and so affected. This is one of the difference between, differences between uh, Wesleyans and Baptists. Now, we'll, look, we'll see this in John 6, 39 through 40. Okay? Jesus said, we already looked at this verse, but now we'll look at it more closely. Jesus said, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. Now it's going to tell us who are the ones who's, who the Father has given to him. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will, not, uh, will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So those the Father has given me is equated with everyone who sees the Son and believes in him. Raise them up on the last day is referring to the final day of our salvation when Jesus comes back. The Bible says that God is going to give us our new, final, resurrected, glorified bodies that are free from sin and defect and that are immortal. Philippians 3, 20-21 it says this, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await for a savior from there. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. The Lord Jesus Christ, he will what? He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. That's why this part of your salvation is called the glorification. Glorification. He will transform the humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. That's what Jesus means by raising them up on the last day. He's going to give us our new glorified, resurrected bodies. But the point here in verses 39 through 40 of John 6, where Jesus says that I should lose none of those he has given me, is that salvation cannot be lost. That once you're saved, you're always saved. Now, sometimes we wonder about people who, they go to church, and they may have... Um, claimed at one point in their life to have accepted Jesus. But then later on in their life, they're not a Christian anymore. And so we ask, well, is that person saved? Or, or maybe we, we know somebody who accepted Jesus, but, but then for the past 30, 40 years, they've been living for the devil. And so we ask ourselves, well, is that person saved? Well, the end, only God knows. God is the judge of the human heart, but we can look at somebody's fruit, the fruit of somebody's life. And we can say, if somebody is denying Christ, that means that person was never saved in the first place. And we can see if somebody's living for the devil for the last 20 or 30 years, then is 
good chance that person was never born again in the first place. They were never saved. We look at a person's fruit. Now, we, we can't and shouldn't make that judgment, but as we're, we're questioning whether or not we should, how we should pray for them and whether or not we should witness to them and how we should counsel them, that's what we do. We look at the fruit. You can tell a tree by its fruit. John 10, 27 through 29. This is a different chapter. We're going to get to this in a few weeks when we get to John 10, but this is where Jesus is reiterating the doctrine of eternal security, that you can't lose your salvation. He says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now, no one includes you. Once you get saved, you can't lose your salvation. Now, what I found in my own personal life as a Christian, I've been a Christian most of my life, is that I go through periods where I backslide. I go through periods where I compromise, where I sin. But the Lord doesn't let me drift for very long. The Lord always seems to come back and pull me in whether it's because he disciplines me or he speaks through another believer or through a sermon I hear or something, the Lord pulls me back. Or just through the Holy Spirit convicting me, making me miserable in my sin. But I have found that I can't run from the Lord for very long. I can't get very far from the Lord before he pulls me back in. He's got me. In other words, this verse, I have found it true in personal experience. That no one can snatch me from his hand, not even me. Now, number four, let's look at a fourth truth about salvation. By the way, uh, on that point, before we move on, eternal security, you need to know that some Arminians believe in eternal security. Some Arminians do not. This is one of the places that there is disagreement, just, just like there is disagreement among Calvinists on the five points of Calvinism. There's also some disagreement among Arminians on those five points, the facts, and this is one of those. As I said, uh, Baptist Arminians, we believe in eternal security, whereas Wesleyan Arminians, they believe that you can lose your salvation. So one of those differences that you, you'll, you'll notice, if you go to a Methodist church, for example, or a Pentecostal church, um, most charismatic churches, they believe you can lose your salvation. All right, number four. Salvation is only possible through prevenient grace. Salvation is only possible through prevenient grace. Now, this is one of those points where Calvinists and Arminians would agree with some qualifications, as you'll see in just a moment. This is one of those verses, it's one of those controversial verses in the Bible between Calvinists and Arminians. This one verse right here. Uh, but, but once I, I explain it to you, I don't think you're going to be confused by it anymore. Verse 44 says, Jesus says, No one can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, Arminians, Calvinists, we both agree on this verse. No one can come to the Father. No one, and that word come is the word erkomai. It's the word belief. No one can believe. No one can accept the gospel unless the Father draws him. That drawing is called prevenient grace, enabling grace, grace that goes before and, and woos us and opens our hearts and helps us to see the gospel this prevenient grace is described in various ways. One theologian named Roger Olson, I recommend his books to you. He's an Armenian who, who writes in a very understandable way. Um, I read this, this year, last year, I read his book, uh, Armenianism, Myths and Realities. Cleared up a lot of, uh, clears up a lot of confusion about Armenianism. He also wrote a book called Against Calvinism. Roger Olson, he says this, he says, prevenient grace is simply the convicting, calling, enlightening, and enabling grace of God that goes before conversion and makes repentance and faith possible. So, both Calvinists and Arminians agree on the doctrine of total depravity. Total depravity. Total depravity essentially means that lost people 
people before Christ, people outside of Christ, are completely enslaved to sin and Satan. They worship themselves. Their, their chief sin is pride. Apart from Christ, who's number one? Me. And I worship me. I live for me. It's all about what, what's, what's best for me. Um, and lost people cannot repent. They cannot, will not believe in Jesus without God going ahead of time and opening up their eyes, opening up their heart. Roger Olson, an Arminian, he says it like this, Arminianism teaches that all humans are born morally and spiritually depraved and helpless to do anything good or worthy in God's sight without a special infusion of God's grace to overcome the effects of original sin. Now we get this doctrine of total depravity from Romans chapter 3, for example, one of the many places, Romans 3, 10 through 12, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, all alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. This is why the Bible says that apart from Christ, you are dead in your sins. You will not, cannot turn to Christ on your own apart from the Father drawing God's provenient grace. Grace. Now, Calvinists, though, they often accuse Arminians of believing in free will. In free will. In actuality, a better term for free will is freed will. Arminians don't actually believe in free will. We believe in freed will. We also believe in total depravity. That apart from the Father's drawing, apart from provenient grace, no one can or will turn to Jesus Christ. But, before salvation, as we're hearing the gospel, the Holy Spirit is moving on our hearts. What is God doing? He is freeing our will. Giving us the ability at that point to either accept or reject Christ. Giving us the ability and even the desire to choose Christ. It's free will, not free will. Adam Clark is actually a, an Armenian Methodist um, commentator, and he, he was from the 1800s. But he talks about this. He says, unless, again, this is an Armenian, he says, unless God thus draws, no man will ever come to Christ, because none could, without this drawing, ever feel the need of a Savior. Without the Father drawing us, we can never see or feel that we need Jesus Christ. Now, Calvinists also make the claim that they believe that salvation is all of grace from start to finish. Whereas they say, Ar Arminians, we, we rob God of his grace and his glory in salvation because, because we believe that, that you have to believe in Jesus. Whereas Calvinists would say, no, you have to believe, but that belief is basically given to you, forced on you, you can't reject it. Uh, in reality, though, that Car uh, Arminians believe that salvation is all of grace because even the ability to believe comes from God's prevenient grace. We would not be, be able to believe in Jesus without God giving us that ability. Now, at this point, there are two debates that exist over the Father's drawing, over this prevenient grace. The first question is, who does the Father draw? The second question is, is the Father's drawing irresistible? The first question, who does the Father draw? Everyone or only some, only the elect, only the few? Calvinists believe that God only draws some to Christ. The elect, those whom he has chosen before time to redeem in Christ. Those are the only ones that he draws to himself. Arminians believe that God draws all men to Christ. Um, and, and there's a couple reasons why we believe this. First of all, the Bible says explicitly that the Father will draw all people to himself through the cross of Christ. John 12.32 Uses the same, Jesus uses the same word draw in this verse. Notice what he says, As for me, if I am lifted up from the earth, he's talking about the cross. If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw who? All people to myself. Calvinists say God only draws the elect. Arminians say no, God draws all people 
to himself, draws all people to Christ. Another reason why we believe that God draws all people to himself is that God is love. We know this from 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16. The Bible says God is love. That means that God only ever operates out of love. Anytime God does something to you, for you, around you, it is only in the spirit of love. God is love. So it wouldn't make sense for a loving God not to draw people to himself, not to give people an opportunity to accept Christ. That doesn't, that doesn't go with God's love, loving nature. Another reason why we believe God draws all people to Christ is that the Bible, again, we, we look at this, says that God desires all men to be saved. God wants everyone to be saved. It says that explicitly in 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So it doesn't make sense to say that God wants everybody to come to repentance, but that he only draws some to Christ, that he only gives some the ability to repent. As well, we already looked at the fact that Christ died for the salvation of all people. 1 John 2.2 2 is another verse that says this, He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. It doesn't make sense for God to send Christ to die for the sins of the whole world, but then not, God not give those people an opportunity to be saved. And so, in a sense, Arminians do believe in irresistible grace. Because we believe that anybody who comes to our church and hears the gospel will be drawn, whether they want it or not, whether they like it or not. God will begin working on their heart. God will draw them. But we don't believe that that drawing, that that grace, that being in grace is irresistible. And that brings us to the final point. The final point, final truth about salvation is that salvation is conditional upon belief in Jesus Christ. Salvation is conditional upon belief in Jesus Christ. Calvinists believe in irresistible grace, that the drawing of the Father to the Son cannot be resisted. In fact, Calvinists believe in what's called pre-faith regeneration. So, Calvinists believe you know, we talk about regeneration, that's being born again. Well, Calvinists believe, first, you're born again, and then you believe. Whereas, what Arminians believe is, you believe, and then you're born again. Uh, as well, uh, Calvinists believe that, first you're given life, then you believe. In other words, first, God gives you new life, gives you this life, spiritual life, then you put your faith in Jesus. Arminians believe, first you believe, and then God gives you eternal life. Right? R.C. Sproul. How many have heard of him? R.C. Sproul. He's a famous theologian, just died recently in the last couple of years. And I love R.C. Sproul, but he's a Calvinist. Um, and, and, and by the way, this is one of the things that I hope you'll learn, is that um, from me, I want to encourage you that there are some wonderful, even if you're an Armenian, there are wonderful books and the preachers out there who are Calvinists. And, and you can be really blessed from them and learn a lot from them without having to accept everything that they say. And there are probably many Armenian, Armenianists whom I disagree with just about everything that they teach except for this one issue of, of <coughs> salvation. R.C. Sproul, though, he says, Our cardinal point of Reformed theology Calvinism, sometimes Calvinism is equated with Reformed theology, is the maxim, regeneration precedes, or goes before, faith. Our nature is so corrupt, the power of sin so great, that unless God does a supernatural work in our souls, we will never choose Christ. We do not believe in order to be born again. We are born again in order to believe. And that's from his book, Chosen by God. Now, Arminians, on the other hand, believe that God's drawing is resistible. That God draws us to himself, frees us to believe, but then we have the responsibility to either accept or reject Jesus Christ. There are several reasons why we believe that God's grace is resistible. 
First of all, just the very wording of John 6, 44, where Jesus says, unless the Father draws, draws him, nobody can come to me. That word, or that verse does not say that all who are drawn by the Father will believe. It's just saying, unless they're drawn to the Father, they will not believe. As well, that very word draw in John 6, 44, it does not mean to force. It doesn't mean to force. Uh, in fact, R.C. Sproul is quoted as saying that the Greek word for draw is defined in Kittle's Theological Dictionary, which is kind of a, a standard Greek dictionary, that it's defined as to compel by irresistible superiority. In other words, to force. R.C. Sproul says that's what that dictionary means, says it means. But actually, if you look up in that dictionary, that word, draw, Jeffrey Bromley is the author and he says this, quote, This is the point in the two important passages, John 6, 44, which is the passage that we're, we're looking at, and John 12, 32, where Jesus says, If I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. He says there is no, no thought here of force or magic. The term figuratively, figurative, figuratively expresses the supernatural power of the love of God or Christ, which goes out to all, but without which no one can come. And so... Kittle's Dictionary actually says it does not mean to force. Um, it means to draw. It means to, to compel us, not forcefully, but to attract us, if you will, to Christ. Give us the ability to accept Christ without actually forcing us. As well, the context of this passage shows that salvation is conditioned upon a response of man. If you look at the very next verse, John 6.45, John 6, 45, right after Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Verse 45, Jesus says, it is written in the prophets. He's quoting from Isaiah 54, 13. And they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, when he says, and they will all be taught by God, He's saying that the Father draws everyone. The Father draws everyone. The Father opens everyone's eyes, gives everyone the ability to accept Christ. But then the next part of the verse, he says, everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me, believes in me. So the Father draws everyone, but only those who listen to the Father, only those who respond, who don't reject that drawing, are the ones who believe in Jesus, who come to him in faith. God does the drawing, but this drawing is not irresistible. Another reason why we believe that grace is not irresistible is that this entire discourse in John 6, Jesus says over and over again that faith precedes life. Remember, Calvinists believe first God gives you life, then you believe. But this passage says over and over again that eternal life follows faith. First you believe, and then you have eternal life. We already looked at John 6, 35, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Remember, this is all part of the same discourse. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Verse 40, even more explicitly, it says, For this is the will of the Father, that... Everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. Notice that faith precedes life. In John 6, 47, Truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. Faith precedes life. Also, Christ says that salvation is conditioned upon faith. We know that throughout the Bible. How do you get saved? Well, there's a condition, isn't there? You have to put your faith in Jesus. Now, the command to believe implies the ability to believe. Why would over and over again the scriptures say, believe in God, believe in God, believe in Jesus, put your faith in Jesus, if that ability is not also given to us through the provenient grace of the Holy Spirit? John 6, 47 again. Truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. That implies that you have the ability to believe. 
And also, the Bible often shows that grace is, is resistible. I'll give you an example. Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus is speaking about the Jews. And he came to say, and in sorrow, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You resisted the grace of God. I came to save you. I wanted to save you. I reached out to save you, but you were not willing. <coughs> B.W. Johnson in the People's New Testament commentary, he said this, Two things are needful to come to Christ the human will to come, and the divine drawing. God draws by the gospel. In other words, as we hear the gospel, that's how God draws us through the Holy Spirit. It is the power of God into salvation. If our will consents so that we yield to the drawing, we will come to Christ. We must trust in the cross for salvation. And so, in summary, the best interpretation of this passage, I think, is, is heavily leaning toward Arminianism. Uh, just to reiterate the points quickly, salvation is only given to some. Salvation is only given to some. Now, in this we are in agreement with Calvinists. The question is, who are the some that salvation is given to? Calvinists would say that God chooses some and then enables them to believe. Arminians would say that, that uh, people believe, or God gives those who believe to Christ. God gives those whom he knew in advance, whom he foresaw in advance would believe. He gives those to Christ. Number two, salvation will never be denied to those who believe. Salvation will never be denied to those who believe. And this we can agree with Calvinists, but Calvinists say that God only allows some to believe. So that the offer and possibility of salvation is only extended to some. Arminians say that the offer and the possibility of salvation is for all people. Number three, salvation cannot be lost. And this we are totally in agreement. And number four, salvation is only possible through prevenient grace. Now this we are agreed, but to whom is that grace extended and is that grace irresistible? Calvinists would say that the grace, the convenient grace, the drawing grace of God only goes out to some. Arminians would say God gives that grace to everyone. God draws everyone to himself. Number five, salvation is conditional upon belief. Salvation is conditional upon belief. Calvinists would say, yes, you have to have faith in order to be saved, but that God gives you this faith and it's irresistible. God gives you this faith, this the ability to believe, and it's irresistible. You will believe if God gives you that ability. Arminians say, no, you have the ability to either accept or reject Jesus Christ. You're given that ability. And through provenient grace, God frees your will. Two different views of salvation, and they do impact the way that you read Scripture, the way that you think about all the main issues of theology. And I hope this morning I cleared a little bit up for you. Some of you, you may be totally confused, even more so. And uh, hopefully we can talk about that some more together. If you have any questions or anything, let me know. But thank you for your attention, and uh, let's pray together, and, and we'll close. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word and for the opportunity to study together. To talk about these deep questions in Scripture, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand your word and Lord, not be afraid of the conclusions that your word leads us to. We pray, Lord, that we would come to a clear understanding of salvation. And most importantly, Father, that we would put our faith in Jesus Christ and follow you. That's what this is all about, Lord. It's about trusting in Jesus, following him as the Lord of our lives. We pray, Lord, that you continue to help us grow as a church, grow deeper in theology but also grow more loving toward you and toward one another. Help us, Lord, to be your hands and your feet this week, to serve you wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.